Well, good afternoon, and thanks for this opportunity to speak at the workshop. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but I have prepared this slide cast, which should uh, allow me to communicate most of the points I want to get across to you anyway. So uh, the first question is, why should we be interested in livestock microbiomes? And, you know, why do we need a reason? Uh, luckily, the BBSRC, in its most recent uh, Forward Look document, actually makes it very clear that we're allowed to do research because we're just advancing the frontiers of bioscience discovery. As it says here, understanding the rules of life, promoting creative curiosity driven frontier bioscience to address fundamental questions. Uh, and that in itself is enough of a reason as far as I'm concerned. The interesting point there also about transformative technologies is that we can address this question, these questions of what's in these microbiomes, what's it doing, using new technologies. And we have uh, exciting new opportunities available to us because of techn technological advances in, in recent years. Of course, a key reason why we should be interested in livestock microbiomes is that livestock are key players in the biosphere, and so are their microbiomes. This is a, a study uh, from uh, last year, published in PNAS, where they looked at the Im impact of humanity on the biosphere, and, uh, and looked at the, to the total quantitation of biomass uh, in, in different uh, taxonomic groups. And you can see here that animals make up a substantial amount of the biomass, and uh, within those animals, livestock uh, are key players there. Um, and as you can see in the figure legend here, it says that uh, the, the, the biomass of livestock uh, and the biomass of humans far surpass that of wild mammals now. Um, and this is also true for wild and domesticated birds, for which the biomass of domesticated poultry, uh, which is dominated by chickens, is threefold higher than that of wild birds. Um, and in fact, uh, humans and livestock together outweigh all vertebrates combined, with the exception of fish. Um, and here's just a, uh, a headline from the BBC news website uh, uh, last year, where they said that actually we should be calling uh, our planet the planet of the chickens, because uh, this bird has taken over the world. Um, and there are now 23 billion chickens on the planet at any one time, making it the most abundant bird by a large margin. But also for those who, who like uh, interesting taxonomic foibles, it's also it's the most abundant dinosaur on the planet currently and probably the most abundant dinosaur that has ever lived. And if we looked at Earth from space and we wanted to detect life here, one of the easiest things for us to detect will be the disequilibrium uh, between the presence of methane in the atmosphere produced by uh, ruminant livestock and oxygen. And this would be a key signature from far, far away uh, that there was life going on on this planet. But if we're talking about planets, uh, it's an interesting point that we know far more about the far side of the moon than we know about the microbes that inhabit our livestock. Uh, and you might say I'm being fanciful here, but you can go to Google Earth and you can download uh, at the map of the moon and you can fly over the surface of the moon and you can look at all the features on that surface and they have all been named and catalogued. Uh, we lack anything like that when it comes to the inhabitants of our livestock. Uh, we are woefully ignorant of, of the vast majority of the organisms that are living in these rich microbial uh, environments. So how do we attack this? This is uh, a slide from a recent talk I've given on our work looking at the chicken gut microbiota. And we have a variety of different uh, approaches available to us. We can use culture, and there's this rather ugly neo neologism of culturomics, where you're basically doing culture on speed. You're doing this high-throughput culture approach. Um, and despite what people have said in the past, or most of these organisms can't be cultured, if you try hard enough, in fact, you can get uh, the majority of these organisms growing in pure culture. Uh, DDA Raoul in Marseille um, and Trevor Lawley in Cambridge uh, have both uh, shown that this is in fact the case. Another approach is one which we've been using also is uh, extracting DNA and then doing a wholesale shotgun metagenome sequencing of that DNA. This opens up two approaches. You can use a reference-based approach uh, where you compare the reads that you have very quickly to what's available in, in, in the databases uh, that are available online, um, approaches like Kraken or Metaflan. The problem with this approach is that this is only as good as the libraries available to you. And so if uh, what's in those metagenomes has previously never been seen before, it will appear, as in this particular 
uh, picture here, uh, figure here, it will appear as dark matter. You can't say what it is. It's just there's something there, but you don't know what it is. Uh, uh, an alternative approach, which is uh, likely to give us a, a richer understanding, but which is much more onerous, is a reference-free approach where you uh, sequence the samples, you get the sequence reads, you assemble them into contigs, and then you bin those contigs using ever more sophisticated approaches that rely on the depth of coverage of the reads, the uh, nucleotide composition of those reads, to, to bin them into uh, draft genomes, uh, what we call metagenome assembled genomes, or MAGs, uh, which can give us um, a rich insight into what's actually uh, living in these particular microbial communities. One of the challenges is that even when we've got uh, 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 organisms growing or we've got mags, uh, up till now, most people have not bothered to give them correctly formed Latin binomials. Um, and, and, and this is essential, really, if we're going to integrate the knowledge we're having for, uh, gaining from these uh, microbial communities um, into the existing databases and make it all accessible to the world research community and that is going to be a challenge going forward. Here's just a few uh, vignettes from the, the field uh, from um, my own research and that of collaborators and so forth. So we did some uh, an early study a few years ago where we looked at uh, microbial and functional diversity within the chicken sequel microbiome using metagenomic approaches been a very highly cited paper, um, uh, and we were quite pioneering, I think, in that area. More recently, uh, Mick Watson here at the uh, at the Roslyn has uh, has been doing similar approaches um, and has made great strides forward, looking at, at the rumen uh, metagenome and, and met rumen metagenome assembled genomes, discovering um, many hundreds of new species and thousands of new genomes. Uh, we've been working in with, with Mick uh, recently also doing similar approaches on the chicken cecum. Um, and uh, method, uh, the, these kind of approaches, uh, the cultural omics approaches, ha are also being applied in, in this context. And here's a, a paper from the Czech Republic where they've been doing this kind of thing on, on the chicken cecum and got over 100 gut anaerobes cultured. Uh, uh, and uh, they're getting uh, dozens of new um, species recognised. Uh, and genomes recognized from this particular context. But of course you can dismiss this and say, wasn't well, this just stamp collecting? But this is the way microbial ecology works. First of all, you have to determine who's there. That's the first question. But then once you've done that, you can then start asking more sophisticated questions like what are they doing there and who are they doing it with? And uh, understanding the functional significance of these new gut uh, microbiota that we're discovering um, and also looking interactions, looking interactions between prey and predator is going to be a very important uh, uh, line of research going forward. Uh, in the chicken gut for example we've we've discovered in some of the samples we get lots of E. coli but we also get lots of different E. coli phages all presumably preying on that E. coli and the interactions between those phages and their host is going to be an in interesting one uh, going forward. But of course understanding this stuff is, and interpreting it is only the starting point. Uh, as Karl Marx made this point a long time ago, the key point is not just to understand things but to make a change. Um, and this is a key area where uh, the livestock industry is interested. Can we use the gut microbiome to influence livestock growth? Here's a, a screen dump from a, a recent blog post uh, talking about research uh, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, looking at whether differences in gut microbiome could improve uh, the growth of, of pigs uh, on farms. But this is obviously a key S question to be addressed across the whole of the the field of livestock as to whether you can actually make beneficial interventions uh, that are, are knowledge driven from your understanding of what's going on in the microbiome. One of the problems here is that there's a lot of hype to do with this and so microbiomes are all the rage and we have to be careful that we don't get too carried away with this um, and I suspect it will be uh, several years or maybe even a decade before we really have a clear understanding of how important microbiomes are and interventions are in this field and what is actually just a load of hype and nonsense. There's an interesting uh, paper from Nature from a few years ago by Bill Hanage where he makes the point that you really have to ask these sceptical, critical questions about um, microbiomes 
you know, do, do the experiments you're doing, uh, detect differences that matter. Um, if you're only doing 16S and you say, oh, there's a ratio of bacteroidetes to firmicutes changes, well, what does that actually mean? It's such a crude thing. Luckily, we are moving to a stage where we can get much more sophisticated answers. But the key point is, if you see changes, is this causation or is it just correlation? Uh, if there are changes and you believe they're causal, what's your mechanism for doing that? Um, and, and, and you know, how far do your experiments represent the reality that you're dealing with? So if you're working in inbred mice, what does that tell you about uh, things like livestock or humans? One key area, of course, of interest is in uh, probiotics, live biotherapeutics, and um, there is a growing body of evidence here for particularly lactic acid bacteria, but other organisms are kind of widely being tested out here. And in this recent review, um, here, here's a, a table showing the, the range of different organisms that have been trialled as probiotics in the different livestock uh, contexts. Um, and here you can see the results um, in poultry um, and, and egg production, uh, where you know, most of the time there is a positive result. But sometimes there isn't. So sometimes, you know, for example, with brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae shows no significant effects on feed conversion ratios uh, in, in poultry. Um, um, uh, and in eggs, uh, uh, um, you can see there in R. capsulatus, there's no effects on egg production or egg quality uh, using this particular thing. So clearly at the moment, we, uh, we have a lot of promise here but this hasn't actually reduced itself down to a clear set of choices. These are the probiotics that we should be using in these livestock. Uh, and it's so self-evident that everyone should be doing it all the time. Fecal microbiota transplants are a key area of interest in human uh, gut microbiology. Uh, and they're established now treatment for C. difficile associated disease. And in fact, in the human field, it's even got to the stage where things are run beyond the science and beyond medicine. And people are actually doing this kind of stuff at home, uh, DIY fecal microbiota transplants. Clearly in livestock, we've been doing similar things for many years. There's this product on the market called Avigard, which allows you to uh, replace the chick microbiota uh, with an adult microbiota. This product really is rather crude. It's simply lyophilized uh, chicken shit. Um, and uh, this uh, means that it, there is batch to batch variation. And I think it's not even licensed for use in some countries like the US because it's not standardized. But other efforts are ongoing here. Uh, Rachel Gilroy, who's uh, recently moved to my group and is a postdoc in my group, but actually just finished her PhD with Paul Wigley uh, in her PhD, looked at the role of fecal microbiota transplants uh, it, as a way of preventing uh, C. Uh, jejuni um, transmission and colonization in broiler chickens and actually um, has showed uh, some positive results there. This is uh, from a review on, on, on uh, the use of um, various ecological interventions in livestock and this particular uh, uh, paragraph focusing on fecal microbiota transplants and highlights that, that, that um, as it says here, fecal microbiota transplantation from chickens with good feed efficiency has not been proved to be effective in modeling the feed efficiency of, of recipient chickens and similarly in pigs, positive and negative effects have been reported. Interestingly, you see later in the paragraph here, they raise the interesting point that you can take kind of wild organisms, the wild relatives of our livestock, and transfer contents from them. Um, maybe this will improve um, the quality of digesting low quality forages and so forth. And this idea of wild to domestic microbiota transplants um, is an intriguing uh, idea that we could play out in a variety of contexts. So, you know. And what we see in wild horses is that going to be a richer uh, microbiota that's more healthy that could be transplanted back into thoroughbreds, for example. Um, but this is all still to play for. We, we, these are, this area is really in its infancy um, uh, and is a growth area coming forward. Of course, one of the key targets is going to be the gut, uh, the rumen in 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 uh, in, in uh, ruminant livestock. Uh, 
uh, Mick Watson uh, here at uh, Roslyn has been one of the key players in looking into this and trying to reduce methane emission emission from this uh, uh, microbial community. It's a, another review, recent review here looking at whether you can use lactic acid bacteria uh, to do this. And it clearly says that there's promising results, but more research is needed in this area. But it's possible we could modulate this. Um, and here's just a quick shout out for, for one of my colleagues, Arjan Narbad, who's been uh, using probiotics and showing that maybe you can use uh, lacto, uh, lactic acid bacteria in, in chickens to prevent colonization by C. jejuni. Uh, another key area of interest and importance is antimicrobial resistance, which is a growing problem in livestock and in humans. And the livestock gut microbiome is clearly a reservoir for this, which is, uh, allows these organisms to leak out to cause in, uh, contamination environment, to colonize humans, and to cause disease in humans and livestock. And there's a great deal of interest in alternatives to antimicrobials, to prevent the selection pressure uh, that, uh, that selects for resistance um, and also to use things like phage therapy perhaps to clear out antimicrobial resistance strains from these particular environments um, so that they cease to be so much of a problem. Of course, uh, we don't have to just rely on what nature has given us. Synthetic biology opens up new avenues where we can take various uh, uh, tools the various resources that nature has provided and recombine them in new ways now obviously in the EU and in the UK at the moment there's not much appetite for genetically modified organisms and so this may put something of a break on this uh, line of work but if we take the longer term view and we take the global view this is clearly an area of interest um, and here's just a few screen dumps and papers showing that basically this is an area where people are trying to develop completely novel organisms that can uh, give us beneficial phenotypes um, and there's even been clinical trials on these kind of probiotics in humans uh, smart probiotics as they're often called um, and clearly this is an area of interest in, in livestock as well um, and you know one area is that we can take these gut microbiomes from livestock and we can apply them for new biotechnological applications so here was just a research topic that was um, on a journal website as a topic for discussion so basically if, if livestock are able to de degrade lignocellulose um, why can't we take the uh, the organisms or these uh, enzymes that are used for that uh, and repurpose them to do this um, in bioreactors or elsewhere um, and of course there is this idea of um, synthetic foods um, uh, and um, there's this uh, perfect day website where they're trying to make uh, um, f uh, milk um, by genetic engineering. They say cows turn plants into milk. It turns out the floor. What they mean by that is that the, the microorganisms can do this too, um, and they can make milk proteins in yeast. Um, and and this is clearly a, a, an area of great interest and growth in the future. And. You know, you might argue that all of this is science fiction, but just in, in preparing this talk, I came across this headline here that, that hydroponics is now uh, becoming kind of mainstream. Uh, this, when I was growing, it was seen as something that was science fiction, but now it's becoming mainstream. So if we fast forward over the next decades, I suspect that there may be uh, some impetus to uh, replace livestock uh, uh, with alternatives uh, and um, it, smart alternatives that actually where you can make the milk that's indistinguishable from, from the milk from cattle but produce it in the laboratory and, and clearly there is a challenge to the livestock industry coming from this impetus to uh, remove animal pr uh, produce from our diet uh, to save our health and to save the planet. But if we're being fanciful, let's, uh, let's just close this by saying, well, we need to get ready for the next revolution. The Neolithic 1.0 was where we domesticated plants and animals and a few microbi microbes as well. I mean, we, 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 we made uh, use of yeast to make bread and beer. Um, but, uh, and, and this transformed diets and societies. But what we're looking to now is Neolithic 2.0, where we domesticate and re-engineer the microbial communities in that livestock. Um, and the hope is that we can transform food production, fight AMR, prevent infection, and up, open up new avenues in biotechnology and synthetic biology by a better understanding and a better domestication of these uh, things. 
So in closing words, I was asked to say, what's your vision for the future role of livestock in food production? But I'd like to say that knowledge should be power here. If we understand, we can manipulate these microbiomes for a far better, in a far better way, improve livestock health and productivity, and there will be biotechnological spin-offs. Uh, how do we, uh, how does research presented in this, and how do we take the steps forward? Well, we need to build a community in the, in the UK, and the UK could lead the way in, in livestock microbiome studies. Um, uh, we're trying to do this. I've, I've called together an animal gut microbiome meeting for various people interested in the field. So vet school next February. And the idea is that we can come together as a community and put in collaborative proposals, work together, build strengths, uh, uh, um, perhaps even put in a BBSRC strategic loader in this field. And that's where we finish. Thank you very much.